Hey guys, how's it going? So uh, we're back um, continuing with this uh, nonsense. <laughs> These uh, 200 records. No, honestly, I've um, I've really actually kind of enjoyed this uh, so far. It's given me an opportunity to talk about a lot of records that um, I've just just have never come up on my channel before. Um, I've only been making videos for um, a little over two years. Yeah, I liked music before 2019. <laughs> there's, there's plenty for me to talk about. Um, so anyway, uh, along those lines, um, I would like to mention um, my friend Chris over at The Long Cut, who just wrapped up his top 100 that he started after I started this and finished his well before I even got to my 100, <laughs> which is great. Um, and uh, Chris's videos are, are fantastic. You're going to see, you've seen a lot of records um, watching my videos that you will see in his if you haven't watched already. And you will see tons of records coming forward on mine that Chris showed in his top 100. We're both huge Uncle Tupelo fans. Um, he's even done the work <laughs> on those guys way more than I have. We're also big Springsteen fans, uh, but he's a Jersey native and has seen him uh, 680 times, I think. So uh, yeah, but um, Chris's channel is great. If you haven't um, checked him out, please do. Uh, I highly recommend it. And yeah, also what he's doing is he's matching his sub number uh, with a monetary donation to Backline, uh, which is a charity um, organization, that nonprofit that deals with uh, mental health. If you go over and you haven't subbed him, go sub to him and it uh, actually contributes to something. <laughs> so yeah, all right. Now let's get on with it. <laughs> Digital gramophone makes no sense. At 1.30, I have Life's Rich Pageant by R.E.M. from 1986. So being born in the late 70s, um, becoming a teenager in the 90s, R.E.M. was huge to me and my peers, and my friends, just as much as they were to people that were 10 years our senior. And that's kind of the thing, you know, I mean, I, I had friends who had older siblings who were into R.E.M. and kind of passed them down to their younger siblings. I always felt like I loved this band when I was younger, but I always felt like I had friends that were even bigger fans than me and um, I don't know why I felt that way, <laughs> but I especially loved the IRS years for a long time, even though it was their 90s albums that really kind of like introduced me, you know, to the band. Life Search Pageant has always been my favorite of those IRS years. It's when the guitars got beefier, Michael Stipe's voice got pushed more forward to the front of the mix. Uh, you could actually understand what he was saying. <laughs> and then you could actually even um, it, apply meaning to his lyrics a lot easier than you could before. That's one of the things that I love about, about this record are the, um, the themes that I feel are a lot more obvious on it than their previous ones. You start with Fall On Me, which is of all of their kind of more famous, uh, overplayed kind of singles, that's the one that I can hear over and over and over again and never get tired of it. And you have uh, Cuyahoga, songs like What If We Gave It Away, uh, Flowers, uh, The Flowers in Guatemala, um, and then the centerpiece, which I feel it's my favorite song on the album, uh, which is I Believe which is great because it, it, it starts with that, that banjo like intro and then it kicks right in to that energetic, you know, jangle pop 
It's just classic R.E.M. And then it touches on, you know, themes of ecological concerns, uh, personal responsibility. Um, and I feel like the previous songs that I mentioned all kind of touch on a little bit of those things as well. And they're themes that really resonate, I think, with their college radio audience. But that's why this album is so great, because they're also themes that resonate still to this day. The other thing that I love about this record is the man pictured on the cover, Bill Berry. Well, everybody has all their kinds of theories about the, the covers <laughs> of, of their early records, all the little gimmicks and things that you could find in them. There was always the thing that said that, okay, well, you've got the blown up, uh, half tone print of like the half screen print of uh buffalo and then bill and buffalo bill okay but i also think and in my opinion this is bill berry's best drumming record <laughs> and um i think he's an incredible drummer so I, I appreciate his work on everything but this one is my absolute favorite uh bill berry record for sure 129, I have Whiskey for the Holy Ghost by Mark Lanigan from 1994. So as I've mentioned previously, uh, my age, uh, when I came up, but the Seattle scene, the grunge, grunge movement, whatever you want to call it, was like a big, big thing for me as a 13, 14, so on year old <laughs> through, through, throughout high school. And uh, I was really into the Screaming Trees. I just, I don't know what it was about them or that specific band, uh, but you know, next to Pearl Jam and Nirvana, um, uh, Screaming Trees was really like my, my band back then. I still like some of their work and certain albums are stronger than others. It was really when I discovered Mark Lanigan's solo material, that just changed everything for me. Um, he, with his solo records, was just operating on a completely different level than than that band. I mean, Mark Lanigan is really, you know, one of my top five favorite vocalists of all time. I mean, to me, he was always kind of like the thing that made Screaming Trees who Screaming Trees were, right? I mean, they did kind of have that retro kind of 60s psych throwback vibe a little bit, but but it was really his vocal style. And when he got into his solo work, he was able to take his, his vocal style other places. He started mining kind of the ground of blues artists. He started kind of mining the same territory as some of the uh, kind of darker, mysterious crooners <laughs> that came before him, like Tom Waits or Scott Walker, um, Leonard Cohen. And he also even kind of touches on, and I would say more so on this record than any of his others, um, he touches on Americana and uh, slight tinges of country um, like Towns Van Zandt. The strength of any Mark Lanigan record uh, just as much depends on who his particular collaborator is. And that's kind of how his solo career is gone. He, he finds you know, one person to kind of collaborate with. And, and it really started with Mike Johnson and Mike Johnson's work on guitar work on this album and, and a few of the others after is just nothing short of spectacular. I know so many people mention Bubblegum and think that Bubblegum is like a great record and it is. But these 90s records on Sub Pop and the work that Mark Lanigan did with, with Mike Johnson will always be my favorite. Jesus Christ been here and gone What a painful place to leave There's frost on the limbs of a cherry tree This cold, cold wind is burying me Swing pendulum, swing slow Got no time to call my my Lord, don't you bother me I'm as tired as a man can be 128, I have I Feel Alright by Steve Earle from 1996. I really got into Steve Earle um, 
first through his record, The Mountain, which he did with the Del McCurry Band, which was a kind of a tribute to bluegrass. After The Mountain, I actually got El Corazon from 1997, uh, and that was the album that really kind of um, exposed me to kind of like the, the expansive breadth of his sound. After really enjoying that record, I remember reading an article. I don't remember what if it, what what magazine it was. If it was Rolling Stone or Spin, and they had like their favorite uh, alt country records of the '90s or something like that. I don't I don't remember, but um, and this one was right at the top. This is just my favorite collection of songs by by Steve Earle. Um, for the most part, it's it's pretty much a straight ahead, just kind of like rock and roll record. Um, but there are certain times where it dips down into blues and um, uh, more kind of like um, Texas, like Plains country, <laughs> um, you know, obviously inspired by uh, Towns Van Zandt. Then there's that, that fantastic duet with Lucinda Williams that closes out the record. And then the performance with the Blind Boys from Alabama um, on the song Valentine's Day, which is just a simply gorgeous tune, was really actually my first, I believe, my first exposure to the Blind Boys of Alabama. And, you know, they would come up again in the next few years. And that's really kind of the role that Steve Earle has played a lot in my life, talking about other artists that influenced him, working with other artists that opened up the doors to their discographies for me. Um, I think that that's the role that Steve Earle has played for a lot of people. At 127, I have Mule Variations by Tom Waits from 1999. In the uh, early 2000s, uh, there was a coworker of mine um, and I became um, you know, pretty good friends with her and, and her husband. And they were both really into Tom Waits, but mostly his earlier work, his 70s work, the kind of piano man lounge guy, Tom Waits. And I was obviously aware of the man, but I had never really listened to, their, to his music. And, you know, those friends of mine were the ones that kind of got me into that stuff. But where Waits really got me excited was like later on, you know, it was the, the 80s stuff with Rain Dogs and Swordfish Trombones. That's where Waits really got me excited. I still have a lot of gaps to fill in with his career. And honestly, after kind of like the, the 2000s and when you got into like the 2010s, like I, I actually haven't really listened to like his newer albums or his more recent albums as much. I think for a lot of people with this record, he was kind of just carrying on with the same material as on um, the Black Rider or um, Bone Machine. And yeah, he definitely is with that kind of weird kind of uh, industrial junkyard percussion sound <laughs> that you find on, on a lot of these tracks. But it's the other songs on this album, the softer songs on this album, that are why I love it so much in contrast to those things. Sure, he can still get uh, weird and, you know, wax poetic <laughs> with um, these strange tales like uh, what's he building in there, which is a which is a, a really crazy, cool kind of like a story song, if you will. But it's the softer side, the folkier side of Tom Waits on this record that I love so much. Songs like Hold On and The, the House Where Nobody Lives, uh, Pony, Georgia Lee, all of those songs are just absolutely gorgeous from this man who has this <laughs> hellhound growl, you know, um, but those songs are simply beautiful. And then of course there's just that that incredible kind of country gospel closer, uh, come on up to the house. Um, I just can't get enough of that song. There's a uh, recent compilation that came out with a bunch of um, female artists covering Tom Waits songs. And it's, it's called, Come On Up To The House. It has several of the songs from this album. Many of the artists on that record have such a contrasting style 
uh, compared to him. But it's like the mark of a great artist when people can so successfully interpret uh, their songs. We have a to watch and a ring made from a spoon. Everyone's looking for someone to blame. And you share my bed, you share my name. We'll go ahead and call the cops. You don't meet nice girls in coffee shops. She said, baby, I still love you. Sometimes there's nothing left to do. Oh, but you got to hold on, hold on. Baby, got to hold on and take your mind. Standing right here, you got to hold on. 126, I have Rocket to Russia by the Ramones from 1977. I had a friend that one time said that in his mind, the Ramones were the greatest American rock and roll band ever. And he was adamant about that. And um, I honestly, I think that there's a lot of merit in that argument. I don't necessarily agree with it. Um, but I think that you could really, that there, a strong case could be made for that. As much as I love the Ramones debut album, and I think objectively, it's one of those records that would definitely be one of the, the greatest rock and roll albums in history. I just happen to love this one. And obviously it's because of the, uh, the even thicker dose of, stronger dose of uh, Beach Boy melodies that run throughout it. And they just lay it on thick with this album. They're, they're not trying to hide anything. It's very obvious. This is what we're doing. You know, it's in the song titles, it's in the melodies, it's in the style of the guitar play, um, and how they work it in to those simple power chord structures. Uh, it's 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 absolutely amazing. I mean, even "Do You Want to Dance" is obviously the cover of the Beach Boys version of the Bobby Freeman song. You know, I mean, it's 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 just it's very obvious. At one twenty-five, I have. In the Airplane Over the Sea by Neutral Milk Hotel from 1998. I have an incredibly complicated relationship with this album. <laughs> I've mentioned it before when I talk about the Apples and Stereo and maybe even a little bit when I brought up of Montreal, but uh, this was the very first album from that whole Elephant Six thing that I ever heard. I had seen it at the top of some list of greatest albums from the 90s, along with uh, Dusk at Cuba's Castle by uh, Olivia Trimmer Control. But this was the first one that I listened to between those two. And yes, it was as revelatory as anything that I had ever really heard um, up to this point in my life. That, however, was 20 years ago. And over time, I just really have felt like the kind of folklore of this album, the um, mythology surrounding it <laughs> uh, gets a little out of control at times. In many ways, this is probably one of the more overrated bands, projects, you know, in the history of popular music. But this album is still absolutely stunning. And I think that this record, if people read about it and become interested, it has a profound effect on them the first time that they hear it. And it's such a profound effect that you never really kind of ever forget that feeling. I've also known so many different types of people that really like this record, different personality types. Quick little story, um, I one time I saw Jason Isbell in the 400 unit. This was probably 2009, 2010. So it was like one, one of the earliest shows, um, the kind of the early times where I was seeing Jason Isbell uh, live. 
and it was at uh, the Handlebar in Greenville, South Carolina. And they'd stepped off stage, and they were going to come out for an encore. And he and Brown and Lawler, the guitarist at the time in the band, they came out together, just the two of them. And they launched into basically an acoustic version of Holland 1945, which is kind of the 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 favorite, you know, the, the popular favorite uh, off this record, if if you could call it call it that. For anybody that's aware of Jason Isbell or um, familiar with him and familiar with like what kind of artist he was in 2009, that was a surprising cover, a glorious surprise. I lost my mind. <laughs> I was like, yeah, I was giddy. <laughs> and I don't know how many other people in that room honestly even knew what the song was to be to be truthful. But again, that just shows you the kind of impact that this album has on different people and different types of artists. You know, he's talked about how it was his time with the drive-by truckers and um, their somewhat strong connection to the Athens, Georgia area that uh, really exposed him to a lot of these bands. <laughs> Arcade Fire from 2004. If you had seen this list 10 years ago, this record would have been easily in the top 50. <laughs> easily. And when it came out in 2004, I was one of the many people um, that were just so profoundly impacted by how incredible this record was. I had friends that I would talk to on the phone that um, that didn't live near me anymore, but um, but we still kept up, and they were really close friends that kind of lived in different parts of the country. And I would ask them, "Have you heard this record?" And we would just go on and on about it and how great it was. And then I would hear those friends of mine talk about how they went to see Arcade Fire on these early shows, and I just never could make it work. Either I couldn't get the night off. Uh, or or what, but I was just, I missed out on these early shows. It's one of the biggest regrets that I have in my life, as far as live music goes, because these guys put on an incredible show, and at that time, they were going down into the audience like to play the song Wake Up, like basically an acoustic format, and, and just like have the whole crowd join in. I mean, it was just un unbelievable stuff. I finally got around to seeing them on like the, uh, the the suburbs tour. It was 2010, 2011. And I saw them at the Ryman Auditorium in Nashville. And that was just, uh, um, yeah, that was an incredible experience, incredible show. But what makes Arcade Fire's shows so incredible are the emotional investment of the band. <laughs> they are all in. And it's that emotional kind of exuberance on stage that is what is so compelling and gets the crowd so wrapped up. But it's also on the records and it's really in this record. It's an album that's born out of grief, but sounds like a celebration, you know? And there's so many also kind of things that it touches on, um, these kind of, uh, at times it feels kind of gothic um, like The Cure, um, and then there are moments that really sound like 
Bruce Springsteen, you know, and and the kind of emotion um, that that he could push forward through a lot of his music. I mean, really, I'm getting kind of uh, emotionally exhausted talking about it. But I'm bumped. I've kind of lost a little bit of the enthusiasm that I had that I once had for this band in recent years, and it's unfortunate, you know, um, because. I don't think it's really where I'm at in my life. Um, I really do think it's 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 in the music. It just doesn't quite feel the same way. And maybe that kind of emotion has kind of like evolved into something that's a little bit more artificial now. I still really love their first three records, but I'll always have a strong attachment to this one, I feel. At 123, I have Meriwether Post Pavilion by Animal Collective from 2009. I first, my first exposure to Animal Collective was Sung Tongs, which I believe came out in 2004. It was 2005's Feels that really, really kind of grabbed me um, with Animal Collective. It's incredibly experimental music. They always had a sense of melody. And it was kind of the way that those albums, Feels and like Strawberry Jam, which came out in 2007, it was all, it was always the way that those albums kind of challenged the listener to find that melody. And once you lock in, those songs, they never sound the way they did initially. They, they go from sounding like, what is this? to something that is just incredibly catchy and you never kind of lose that melody in your head, you know? I have a little bit more of a personal attachment to this record. My younger brother's always really loved music as much as I have, but we've always kind of, for many, for many, many, many years, where we would cross paths, we're always kind of in the same typical kind of places, um, but then he was really into a lot of different things as a teenager that I was into when I was a teenager and so on. We're like three and a half years apart. For some reason, he got really into this kick of, of trying to find bands that he felt sounded different than anything that he had ever listened to up at that point. And he was kind of trying to challenge himself a little bit, I think. And he just made such a strong connection with, with Animal Collective. And it's a band that for several years, especially around this time, where he and I just like really, really bonded um, over Animal Collective. We went and saw them twice. I think we kind of, um, the song Brother Sport, which kind of closes this record, I think we kind of like consider that like kind of a song connection for us. My brother and I like a lot of brothers, especially as close in age as we are. Um, have had many contentious moments over the years. But that's why I love that we have this connection over this band and in particular this record because this record, um, it just sounds like pure joy to me. And um, as strange as it can be at times, distorted and weird as it can get in places, um, it's still just like pure joy. And I'm glad that we have that kind of that one connection where I just think back on when we went to those shows together and when we've listened to this music together and we've talked about this music together and um, just, you know, have a lot of just happy memories that I feel like we'll, we'll always kind of be able to like hang on to. At 122, I have Low by David Bowie from 1977. This album and one more album on this list that we'll get to eventually are albums that... I have always kind of felt like I've been told I am supposed to love this album. Like this is an album that everybody is supposed to love and revere. My younger years and my teens, like I, I mean, everybody, I just remember everybody was pretty much consensus that like um, Ziggy Stardust and the Spiders from Mars were, was like the greatest Bowie album. Like it just how it was. And then all of a sudden, no, it's Low by David Bowie. <laughs> and I don't know if I just wasn't willing to accept that or what, 
um, it was really what it was, was it was, it was everybody telling me that this is the best and this is what you have to love this album that I just like, I just felt like I just needed to reject it. <laughs> Luckily I had a friend that kind of, uh, persisted with me and, uh, I finally gave this album a shot. And when you do, when you give into this album, it is a it is an amazing experience. That kind of experimental disco funk pop thing going on on the first side and then the second side. That's what this album is. It's a tale of two sides. And it's that that B side, that second side. Uh it's just a sonic adventure. There are days when I just want to play side B. And I'll just pull it off the shelf and just play side B and that's it. At 121, I have Damn the Torpedoes by Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers from 1979. A bit of a confession, but I'm not even going to call it a confession because I, I don't feel sorry about it. You know, I don't feel sorry about it at all. I have always just felt that Tom Petty's albums as a whole, for as many records as he has out, I've just always felt that he was a better writer of songs than he was an orchestrator of the complete album. There are two albums, and I think that this is kind of the general feeling from a lot of people. There are two albums of his that stand above the rest. One being Wildflowers, which came out later in his career, and obviously everybody's been gushing over recently <laughs> um, because of the reissue. And then there's Damn the Torpedoes, um, which I think is just this band's greatest uh, achievement on record. Every single song is fantastic. You know, and I have those little info cards over here and I select certain songs and I wanted to put every single song. But yeah, I mean, everybody knows Tom Petty. Everybody knows this album. I don't really need to get into it. Uh, I just think it's a fantastic rock and roll record. I'm a rock and roll guy, you know? <laughs> And it's good to be reminded of that. And Tom and the boys, they remind me of that. They remind me of that with this album. Well, Jeopardy category, concept albums. Players, here's your clue. Director Sam Peckinpah considered making this Eagles album into a movie. Yep, 30 seconds. Good luck. 